Hallelujah. Yeah. I'd like to give thanks to God for the praise by our uh, praise team and the choir. Have you ever thought of uh, a situation or a circumstance where you cannot praise God? You cannot sing to God. Have you ever experienced because you lost your voice or because you are not allowed? And then I started thinking about, what about if I wanted to give worship to God and I'm, I cannot, I just cannot, I'm not allowed to. I want to give offering to God, I am not allowed to. I want to translate, I want to serve, I want to come to church, but I cannot. And I think that would be a great suffering and agony if I want to worship God and I cannot. Uh, this week, uh, from different experiences, different testimonies, this is what I uh, was uh, kind of praying about, thinking about. There are people who want to worship God, but they cannot. But the fact that, as choir sang, every corner sings and we sing our songs to God. That is a privilege. Can we give thanks to God for, being, for allowing us to freely worship Him? Amen. Amen. So with that in mind, <clears throat> I'd like to continue in our studies of Leviticus. This is the ninth study. Holy Before the Lord is the title. Holy Before the Lord. Today's chapters, uh, we read a passage in chapter 16 and a passage in chapter 17. These chapters are very important, not only in Leviticus, but throughout the entire Bible. Uh, and we are going to only think about a couple of issues, a couple of topics that are covered in these chapters. In Leviticus, holiness is related to life. And defilement or uncleanness is related to death. The question and the, the topic that we need to be focusing on today is, is life more or death more in, my, in me? Does life weigh much more to overcome death or does death weigh more to overcome my life? Because the source of life is God, and He is holy. And in these chapters, holiness is referred to as cleanliness. On the contrary, death is opposite of holiness and is considered unclean. Source of life is God Himself, and He is holy. And we must be holy in order to receive that life. Or we can even say, when we receive God's life in us, we become cleansed to become clean, holy. But when that life in us diminishes, we all, each of, every one of us, have life in us. Let me ask you to think, how much of that life is left in me? Not only in terms of how many years do I have left in my life, but how much of that life of God do you have in you? Are you filled with that life or are you empty? Are we 50%? But when that life diminishes in us, we are drawing, drawing ourselves closer and closer to death, which is considered unclean. We can even say that defilement draws us closer to death because it keeps us from coming close to life. One of the important concepts that we have to keep in mind as we study these chapters <clears throat> is that in this section, it explains that blood represents life. Or more specifically, blood contains life. All right. So just as blood is in our body, there should be life in us, but what kind of life is in you? Is the question that we need to be asking. 
Because we say there is life in the blood. And if there is life in the blood, blood must be clean. But there is blood that is not clean. So let us think about two general, two main sections. First section comes from Leviticus chapter 12 through 15. Uncleanness in a person. So each chapter deals with one topic. So we're going to go through them briefly. First, unclean after giving birth. Chapter 12, Leviticus chapter 12 is about uncleanness of a woman when she gives birth. Now, the question that we must ask is, <clears throat> giving birth is a good thing or a bad thing? Good thing. Giving birth is giving life. How come the woman who has give, done a good thing of giving life is considered unclean? How is that unclean? And more specifically, let us read verses 2 through 5. <clears throat> Leviticus chapter 12, verses 2 through 5. Speak to the sons of Israel, saying, When a woman gives birth and bears a male child, then she shall be unclean for seven days, as in the days of her menstruation, she shall be unclean. On the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. Then she shall remain in the blood of her purification for 33 days. She shall not touch any consecrated thing, nor enter the sanctuary until the days of her purification are complete. But if she bears a female child... Then she shall be unclean for two weeks, as in her menstruation, and she shall remain in the blood of her purification for 66 days. So according to the law in Leviticus, when, a, a, when the woman gives birth to a son, she cannot come back to the temple for how many days? Seven days plus 33 days, altogether 40 days. When she gives birth, birth to a daughter is double. 14 days, 2 weeks, plus 66 days, so 80 days. Again, why does giving birth because uh, why does giving birth cause the mother to be unclean for 7 days or 14 days? The answer is found in verses 4 and 7. Verse 4, it says, She shall remain in the blood of her purification. And then verse 7, it says, Then he shall offer it before the Lord and make atonement for her, and she shall be cleansed from the flow of her blood. So she is unclean because of the flow of her own blood. Because of her own blood. We thought there is life in the blood, and blood should be clean. But here we can see human blood is not considered clean. Why? Because of sin. Because of sin, the life of God that was given to mankind, the breath of life, is taken out. We rejected that life. We're living upon the human life that we have, finite life. And because we have sin in us, the life in us, the blood in us, is considered unclean. She is considered unclean not because she ate or touched something unclean, but because of her own blood that flowed out while giving birth. And that's why there are passages such as Psalm 51 verse 5. This is David's repentant, repentance psalm. Psalm 51 verse 5, he says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in my sin my mother conceived me. Because of the original sin and inherited sin, David realized it's not a sin that I learned while I was living in this world. It's not a sin that, I, that was contagious and I, I somehow attained in my life. It's not a sin that I learned. It's a sin that I was born with. Matthew 15, 17 through 20. Matthew fifteen seventeen through 20, Jesus says, Do you not understand that everything that goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is eliminated? 
But the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and those defile the man. For out of the heart comes come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, slanders. These are the things which defile the man, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile the man. Jesus is saying what defiles the man is what comes out of the man. What's inside? Defilement, uncleanness is inside of us. Let's go on to the next chapter. Second, chapters 13 and 14 speak about leprosy, also known as uh, some people call it Hansen's disease or skin disease. <clears throat> In the Bible, leprosy was considered a disease that is closely, closely related to sin. Leprosy has long latency period, and it attacks the nervous system, the skin, the eyes, and even respiratory tract. It causes the person to lose his or her sense of pain. And so uh, the person who has serious case of leprosy would not feel any pain. And their bodies, because of this disease, will start to decay. And their, you know, their fingers, their toes, their ears, their eyes would decay and fall off. And they would not feel a thing. Eventually, their organs, their respiratory system, they fail and cause death. In the Bible, leprosy was considered a spiritual disease. Spiritual meaning it's physical symptoms that is caused by the spiritual condition. When they sin against God. But... In application today, we can look at it as a spiritual disease because it, is, it shows symptoms that we cannot see. Spiritual symptoms when, we, when our relationship is disconnected from God. Decaying is caused when circulation does not take place, is cut off. When the blood does not reach a part of the body, it will start to decay. When there is no spiritual circulation, when the, the life is not provided to our soul and our body, that's when there is disconnect. And when that disconnect, that, that interruption in circulation, takes place for a longer period of time, it's starts to cause decay. Spiritual sickness is when there is decay proceeding, process of decay taking place in our soul, in our life, but we don't feel a thing. We don't sense it. Our conscience is seared. Our spiritual sense of hunger for the Word of God, even the sense of fear because I'm my relationship with God is so distant. All, that, all those senses are nulled, all uh, are, are dead. Interestingly, leprosy is recorded in the Bible, in the Synoptic Gospels, before, uh, during Jesus' ministry, and we know that Jesus healed lepers, people with leprosy. But it's not recorded anymore after Jesus' death on the cross. The message is, and especially in the Gospel of John, the message is, Jesus' blood cleanses even our spiritual and physical leprosy. So I pray that the blood of Jesus will cleanse us from our sins, from our uncleanness. May we, if, even if we have been away so long, spiritually detached so long, in the slump for a long time, suffering for a long time, may we be able to come back to God. Because cleansing process is very, very simple. Sim more, more simple, simpler than you could ever imagine. 
What do you need to do? You're already here in the sanctuary. Pray to God for the cleansing power of Jesus' blood. That's it. Is that too easy? Is that too cheap? Or did you feel, do you feel like you hit a lottery today? Whatever you might be going through, whatever uncleanness you might be suffering with, I pray that you will just lift up that prayer and believe that the blood of Jesus will cleanse you. Third, chapter 15 speaks about people with discharge. Person with discharge. Leviticus chapter 15 verses 2 through 18 is about men's discharge from his body. And verses 19 through 30 are about women's discharge. Uncleanness from discharge is presented as more serious than the previously discussed uncleanness with animals or even with leprosy. People with discharge, even the chairs that you sit on, that chair becomes unclean. And if another person touches that chair, that person becomes unclean. It's very contagious. So I pray that you and I may not come close or touch the spiritual uncleanness in our life because it's quite contagious. It spreads. Something interesting and amazing is you might be wondering, am I clean or unclean? Are you clean? Did you take a shower this morning? But then, uh, more than that, spiritually, throughout the week, what did you come in contact with? We learned last week about coming in contact with unclean animals, right? And what that means in our spiritual life. What did you come in contact with? What did you consume spiritually and physically? The ideologies, the thoughts. What did you speak? Jesus said, what comes out of your mouth, what comes out from your inside is what makes you unclean. What thoughts did you have? Are you clean or unclean? Say amen if you're clean. I'm clean. Wow. Many liars here. Are you clean? But I, I apologize for saying liars. Many people of faith. Because what I'm about to say is, amazing thing is, no matter how unclean we may be, I pray and be, let us believe, as soon as we come into the sanctuary to worship God. Kind of like when we had COVID-19 time, and there's you know those... Uh, what do you call it? Uh, sanitizing entrances. And sanitized. We, when we come into this church, I believe that God cleanses us. Yeah. So, how many of us are clean? Amen? We are all clean. At least we will be clean as we go out that door. Amen? Amen? Let's pray for that. Interestingly, this, this uncleanness from discharge, I, I mentioned, is presented as more serious than anything. But the purification process is simpler and easier. Remember, woman who gave birth, the purification process was how many days? For a woman who had a son, 33 days. For a woman who had a daughter, 66 days. And after that, they have to come and give burnt offering and, and sin offering and so on. But here, for the uh, uncleanness because of discharge, they just need to wash their clothes, bathe in water, wait seven days, and give burnt offering and sin offering with only two turtle doves or two pigeons. Cost-wise, it's very, it's, it's not expensive. Right? Just, just do that and you're clean. So what's the message here? But then there are, 
Uh, and we're going to talk about this next week. There are serious offenses that can even be, cause, us, cause them to be cut off from their people or even death sentence. For example, chapter 20, verse 18. This is a preview of what is to come next week. Chapter 20, verse 18. If there is a man who lies with a menstruous woman and uncovers her nakedness, he has laid bare her, her flow, and she has exposed the flow of her blood. Thus, both of them shall be cut off from among their people. So, these are the three examples of what causes people to become unclean. But after this, chapter 15, we come into chapter 16 and 17. This is the next section, Leviticus 16 and 17. And it's, it teaches us about the Day of Atonement and the importance of the blood. So under this section... And the reason why I'm covering both sections is what first section talks about what causes us to be unclean. But then second section that we're talking about today, Leviticus 16 and 17, is the solution. If we are unclean, what is the solution to that? How do we become clean? And this is the Day of Atonement. So we're going to, as the first part of this second section, think about the process of the Day of Atonement. Uh, we have studied this in uh, the sixth book in the History of Redemption series, what the, the high priest does on the Day of Atonement in more detail. Today, I'm just going to go through the list of what he does. Leviticus chapter 16, pretty much the whole chapter. First, the high priest puts on the holy linen tunic, chapter 16, verses 3 through 6. And the high priest, who was Aaron during that time, the first high priest, needs to sacrifice a bull of a sin offering for himself and his household in order to enter the holy place. So because Aaron, during that time, even the high priest was human being, he, was, he had sins. His household had sins. And therefore, he needs to be forgiven of his sins before he can even enter the holy place to, uh, to do the work for the atonement of the people. So the bull is for himself and his household. Second, the high priest takes two male goats, picks a lot for one to be given as a sin offering, and the other as Azazel. Verse 5. Third, he takes a fire pan full of coals of fire from upon the altar, uh, from the altar of burnt offering, and two handfuls of finely ground sweet incense inside the veil. What is that place called? Inside the veil, the Holy of Holies. This is the first time he enters the Holy of Holies. What he does is he puts down that pan of fire with coal. And what, what does it do? It causes smoke. And that smoke needs to cover the entire, all of the Holy of Holies to a point where he cannot see anything. And it's making like a cloud on this earth. God's presence was represented and shown by the cloud. And this is chapter 16, verses 12 and 13. Fourth, he takes some of the blood of the bull and sprinkles it with his finger on the mercy seat. This is the second time he goes into the Holy of Holies. He brings the blood from outside of the bull and sprinkles it on the mercy seat on the east side. Also in front of the mercy seat with seven times, seven times with his finger. Verses 14 and 15. Then he does the same with the blood of the goat. Remember there were two goats. One was killed for sin offering. Not burnt yet, but the blood was drawn. Right? And the other is still alive because it needs to be sent as an Azazel goat. Fifth, he sprinkles the blood of the bull and of the goat on the horns of the altar. 
on all sides of, uh, of the sin, uh, uh, for the sins and impurities of the sons of Israel. So what he does, he takes the blood inside into the Holy of Holies. He sprinkles the blood. So he, th- these animals has, have taken upon themselves our sins. The sin of the priests, sins of the people, right? And so this, is this clean blood or, or un- unclean blood? This is a blood of the animal that has taken upon themselves the, the sins of all mankind. Right? And they would take that blood into the Holy of Holies, to, to the presence of God, and sprinkle that blood on God, basically. Right? And then he takes the blood out from the Holy, place, holy of Holies and sprinkles it back on the altar. Do you understand what he's doing? Verses 18 and 19. Sixth, he takes the remaining goat, which is the Azazel goat. Azazel is uh, well known as, also known as scapegoat, as we know. Uh, The one that takes all the blame and is killed also in a different way. It's sent away. So the high priest lays his hand upon that goat, and transfers all the sins of all Israel upon his head and sends it away into the wilderness to be killed, to die with our sins. Verses 20 through 22. Jesus died both as sin offering but also as Azazel, taking upon himself all of our sins. The high priest then comes into the tent of meeting takes off his linen garments. So throughout this entire day, in the, pro- the whole process, high priest is not wearing the colorful garments that we know of. He's only wearing the fine linen white garments. <clears throat> but at this time, he takes off uh, the linen garments, bathes his body with his water a whole, uh, in a holy place, and put on his clothes, then his own clothes, Then he comes forth and offers his burnt offering and the burnt offering of the people and make atonement for himself and for the people. Remember he had drawn the blood of the bull and the goat. Now he's he's burning them. Verses 23 and 24. Then he offers up in smoke the fat of the sin offering on the altar. Verse 25. Eighth. The hides, flesh, and refuse of the bull and the goat of the sin offering for atonement are burned outside the camp by somebody else, by another priest. And the one who burns them shall wash his clothes and bathe his body with water before coming back into the camp. Verses 27 and 28. And that's basically what is taking place on the Day of Atonement. That is basically what Jesus did. On the cross. The difference between ordinary sin offerings and and what they do on the great day of atonement. In an ordinary sin offering, the blood is sprinkled toward the entrance of the holy place. And that's it. But on this day of atonement, the blood is taken into the holy of holies, then brought back out. We, we talked about that, right? The blood is taken in and sprinkled onto the mercy seat, onto the, the Ark of the Covenant, and then it is brought back out and sprinkled upon the altar, signifying the blood coming from the holy place, cleansing the impurities of the people. It's not just transferring of our sin to God, but it is also receiving the cleansed blood, His blood. That comes out of the Holy of Holies. Now as conclusion, the purification and atonement procedures in Leviticus may seem complicated. But we can understand it through the key words, through just these two words, life or death. Life and death. God makes a way to fill our void with his life. After the fall of mankind, the life in us, we reject it. 
And Satan has taken it, caused us to lose it. The only thing that is remaining in us is the physical life, like, like a broken flower. It looks like it's alive, but it's just a matter of time it will wither. Right? That's the kind of life that was left in us. We're empty. What God wants to do is to fill us back with his life. Would you like to receive that life? I believe that's why we are here. However, we are always so prone and vulnerable to uncleanness around us. The Israelites were living in Egypt in contact with unclean things, idols, living within the culture of uncleanness. The Israelites, after entering to the land of Canaan, they could not get rid of all the Canaanites. They actually assimilated into the Canaanite culture and religion. And therefore, they were living in the midst of unclean culture and unclean people. Likewise, you and I are living in this world of uncleanness. It is very easy for us to become unclean. If, especially if, if, if things happen, uncleanness takes place like the Old Testament, by, just by touching it. Right? But even spiritually, we are living in a world where there are so many unclean inputs through our ears, through our eyes, through our mouth. There's so many unclean things that we come in contact with that it is very difficult for us to stay clean. And what that uncleanness does, it puts a veil, a barrier, a gap between us and God. Throughout these chapters, one thing that we have to remember is uncleanness is not necessarily considered sin. Some are, some are. Uncleanness can be cleansed. Though it's not sin, what it does is it prevents us from coming to God. And what happens when we cannot come to God? We cannot receive the supply of life. And that's how it kills us. It's not the uncleanliness that itself kills us, but it keeps us from coming to God for a long period of time. And that's what kills us. That's Satan's strategy. How often do you breathe? Silly question. We don't even think about how often we breathe because we just continue to breathe. Have you ever tried... I don't know if I should tell you to try, but have you ever tried to breathe just one time? Every, one, every minute. Only one time a minute. Can you live? You want to try? I'll give you a minute. Who's healthier? A person who continues to breathe constantly or a person who just breathes deeply only once a minute or once every two minutes. Who's healthier? How many, how often do you drink water? Who's healthier? A person who drinks water periodically throughout the day or a person who just drinks water only one time a day or one time in two or three days? Who's healthier? Now spiritually, not being able to come to God constantly has spiritual consequences of not being able to receive the Holy Spirit and the supply of life. So, same question as I asked before or in the beginning. How much of life do you have? How much of God's life do you have in you? Are you empty? Do you need refueling, refilling? Avoiding defilement and uncleanness and giving our best effort 
in being purified and coming before God is the life of a true saint. And that is a privilege, special privilege, you and I are given to be able to come to God. Please do not lose that right. You know, children, it doesn't matter if the dad is a king or prime minister or president. They just have to open the door and go in and give a hug to the daddy. While other people have to make appointments and wait months after months just to have a meeting with the king or the, the person. You and I are given that privilege. All we need to do is to open that door and go in. Do you understand what a great privilege it is? And what do we get every time we go, come in contact with him? We are cleansed and we're given life. I pray that you and I will receive that life. How many times a day? Or how many times a week? Only on Sundays? Only on Sundays? Let's try to visit him more often so that, and see the difference. See the difference. Do you, you can try this to a point where it won't kill you, okay? Try breathing one long breath just once a minute for an hour. How well can you live? I know, no, don't try it. I'm, I'm afraid. Don't try it. Versus when we breathe in well, especially good oxygen, that will give us healthier life. When we were studying the series on Leviticus, I shared about the structure and importance of the book of Leviticus. To the Hebrew minds, center place holds the greatest importance and significance. Center place is a special place. And so to the Hebrews, the Torah, you understand the Torah. What's the Torah? What's another name for Torah? The Pentateuch, the law. How many books in the Bible? The first five books of the Bible, right? Do you know the first five books? Shall we begin? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. What's at the center? Leviticus. Okay. To the minds of the Hebrews, what's at the center is the main focus. Right? Can we show the, the chart? And looking at the chapters and the content of Leviticus, let's go from outside, right? regulations of the offerings and feasts, and then regulation of the priests, the regulation of the purification and holiness, and then the center is the Day of Atonement, cleansing of sins, cleansing of defilement. The Day of Atonement is the focus of Leviticus. And so, the central message of the Torah, the Bible, is Leviticus. And the central message of Leviticus is atonement. The focus here is that God really wants us. That's the message. Simple message. God really wants us. He wants to be with us. He wants us to open that door and come in through that door to his to where his 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 bedroom Max Lucado Max Lucado Lucado said the maker of the stars would rather die for you than live without you and that's a fact the maker of the universe would rather die for us so that he can be with us than to live without us. Isn't that amazing? That's the message of Leviticus. We, mankind, 
and you can take away the, the chart. We, mankind, we <coughs> lost that life. God made man into living being. We lost that state of living being. And Jesus came not only to cover, atone for our sins. You know what's, what's the next step or, or deeper step after you know, forgiveness, atonement of sins? You know, you forgive sins, you cover for sins for a purpose. Right? You don't just do it and that's not the end of it. For example, Rahab was a great harlot in the city of Jericho, right? Salmon was a man in the line of Judah, the royal lineage from Israel, right? What, what did they do? You know? What happened between Salmon and Rahab? Married, Right? But before that marriage, what did Salmon have to do? He had, his name means to cover, to atone. He had to forgive and cover and wipe away, forget and, and forgive the, her sins of the past in order for them to be married. Likewise, atonement is a process, is a means. What is what is the purpose? Redemption. Jesus atoned for us on the cross for the purpose of redemption. He wanted to give us back that life and make us living beings again. Our founding pastor, Reverend Abraham Park, he said this, When Adam rejected and denied the word, which is the breath of life given to him, there was no life in him anymore. And that's why the tree of the knowledge of good and evil looked good for food to the eyes and desirable to make one wise. If he, if he had God's breath of life still in him, the tree would not have looked good. Do you understand? He was tempted because he had lost that life. May we regain that life so that we will not be tempted by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He was void of life. That's why he wanted to satisfy him, fill himself with whatever he can see, whatever temptation that was before his eyes. Jesus, once again, wanted to give that life back to us by bringing the word to us. He said, receive me. I am the word. He said, listen to my word and believe it, then you will have life in you. He wanted to fill us back with that life. However, people did not understand and people did not accept that word. Their ears were filled, their hearts were filled already with other words, deceptions, accusations. That's why Jesus put that life in his blood. Just as the blood was, went into the Holy, Holy of Holies and came back and sprinkled the altar, Jesus brought that clean blood, that life in the blood, and shed it upon the altar of the cross. Life is wrapped up in that blood. And he left it for us. And then he said this, we read, we read Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you on the altar of the cross to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood by reason of life that makes atonement. John 16, 12, and 13. Before Jesus left, he's, he told this mystery key, gave this key to the disciples, saying, I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Meaning, I want to give you this word, but you cannot open it. You cannot bear them. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. I sincerely pray that you and I 
will receive that life. Through this word, revealed and unwrapped through the history of redemption. Do you have that life? Unless we are filled, you, yourself, me, myself, unless we are filled with that true life, our efforts of evangelism is in vain. It's just the, for, for the formality. Unless I have that life, I cannot share that life with anybody else. So I sincerely pray every ministry department, every person will be filled with that life. Every time I, I'm on the plane, there's something that does not make sense to me. When they give you the instructions of emergency cases, they say the, the gas, uh, the, uh, gas, not gas, a mask, air mask will drop. And what do they say? Help yourself first before you help others. And then the picture is like parent helping the child. That goes against every parent's heart. Why? Because every parent would want to save my kid first before I, I live. But then when you think about it, well, that's true. Unless I have life, I cannot give life to that other person. So I pray, the, the, the most important thing, we are doing missions work, we are doing evangelism, but most important thing is for our members to be filled with life first. May you be filled with life, may you be filled with blessings, may you be filled with God. Just knock on the door and enter in. Enter in. Even at your home. Just, uh, just go into your room and knock on the door. God, I want to come in. I, I need to be cleansed. May you be cleansed. May there be nothing in between you and God. Not even a, a sheet of veil. May we be able to come to God and may you receive that life. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us your life. We thank you for giving us this word that will cleanse us. Help us, Father, to come before you and receive your word day by day, moment by moment. May we walk with the Holy Spirit so that uncleanness may never come upon us. Even if it does, Father, we pray that the power of your blood, the power of your word will cleanse us clean. Father, we pray, I pray that you will allow Zion Church members, all of them, to be filled with your life. Father, please do not forget us. Allow us to receive that supply of life every moment. Father, allow us to be able to sing to you and be cleansed. Allow us to be able to come pray to you and be cleansed. And Father, we pray that as we do many different things for your ministry, keep us clean, Father. And help us to be filled with your life. Help us to overflow with your life. That we may run, never run out. Thank you so much for your grace. And in Jesus' name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Let's give thanks to God. Amen.